Hi, this is Anna Hackman from Green Talk, and today we have Stacy Hughes, who's the principal of Sunlight General Capital, and she's going to walk us through a purchase power agreement as well as financing of a solar system. It's a little tricky, and I've asked Stacy on the show so she can kind of work me through the financial aspects so that everybody can understand why it's beneficial to use solar for municipal as well as private installations. Welcome, Stacy. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. Now, let's get right into it. Tell me a little bit, what is Sunlight General Capital? Sure. Sunlight General Capital is uh, basically a financer and developer of solar projects, primarily in the Northeast. We work with clients, whether they're municipalities or private institutions, private commercial entities, to put bring solar power into their day-to-day -day mix. So that might be a rooftop installation, or it might be something where they build a carport and protect their parking lot. But at the end of the day, it involves a lot of solar panels generating electricity that we pay for and put on their grounds for their use. Now let's go back to that about we pay for it. This is it called a purchase power agreement. And how does that all work um, from both a private and municipal standpoint? OK. I mean, it's very similar from a private or municipal standpoint. It's the same principle, although you might find that some of your details vary a little bit. So let me just keep it uh, big picture for the moment. You know, a lot of people and companies are very excited about solar these days. They love renewable energy. They want to get their utility costs down. And they see solar as something exciting and interesting that they'd like to have at their company or home. The problem, when most people go to look into it in a little more detail, it costs quite a bit more than they had envisioned or can budget for. And while they could put it on their own roof for you know, maybe uh, 10 years and they'd be in a good break-even situation, not everyone has the cash up front. And that's where we come in, and that's where a power purchase agreement works. To give you just a quick thumbnail sketch of what that is, we basically come in, and let's just take a, a classic simple installation. We come in, and let's say it was a million dollar installation. We put all the money up front. We work with the client or the host to make sure it's a system that they're comfortable with, that they get to help design, they know what's going to be there. We build it with a construction partner. We pay for everything. And then we sell them the power uh, in a power purchase agreement. Basically, all the solar electricity that the system generates on our client's roof, he gets to buy as his first source of power. It's cheaper than he is currently paying to the utility. And then over time, over the long haul, he can basically be in a position where he can own that system, but it takes some years. Uh, so we come in by financing it up front, and then we sell them the power at a cheap rate, and eventually they can take over ownership of the system. Now, when, why would somebody, let's say, given, it depends on the state, like New Jersey is given pretty good rebates, and now you've got the state with the 30%, um, I mean, the, the federal government with the 30% grant this year of money, and 179D deductions. I'm really not sure if a 179D deduction works in this instance. Is it simply, a, do people simply do this because they don't want to put the cash up front, or is there other advantages to it? In most cases, it's because they don't want to put the cash up front. Um, the, the rebates and incentives that you mentioned are extremely important to this process. They're essential. In fact, there is a federal uh, grant. It's 30 percent. There's uh, really um, advantageous accounting and tax perspectives. There are state incentive programs that vary state by state. So one reason is just the upfront money, but the other is dealing with the complexity of all of those components. To some degree, you really want to have if you're looking at this for your own business, you really need to have an accountant vet it, a tax professional vet it. You need to be comfortable with what the state is offering from a regulatory perspective. And not every company feels like that's their business model. They don't necessarily want to get involved and try to understand that model. So A, we provide the upfront money to them. They can then spend it on other purposes related to their business. But B, it's a fairly complicated business. And uh, as a team of former bankers and lawyers and tax professionals, we're, we're pretty well equipped to to do that for them. Now, what about when you have a roof that is over five years old? How do you guys deal with that? Do you somehow merge the cost into that roof, you know, um, change up to do solar? Well, it's a really good question, and I think it's something where, in general, people in the solar industry are giving a lot of thought to the question. There's not a, a cut and dried answer. I think that one of the constraints that faces the country as we hopefully move to a more solar model or at least getting a larger percentage of our, our revenues from that, will be the age and condition of a lot of the roofs. You know, a lot of roofs it's just not going to work for. And, and replacing a roof, as, as most homeowners and business owners know, is very expensive. There are situations where a roof might be over five years old, but it's in terrific condition. 
there might be a situation where we can, well, we would work with the roofing manuf the roofing um, professional to look at their warranty and go back and have them verify that solar will work, and they're very comfortable and familiar with that. In some cases, though, um, we have a little bit of a budget where we can say, well, you know, maybe somebody's power is going to cost them a, a penny more, but we're going to roll some of that into fixing up their roof for them. It's very case by case, and it's an important issue, I think, for the industry. You know, it, it, on a countrywide perspective, and we just have to deal with it as it comes. If your roof basically isn't strong enough or isn't in poor condition, it will be an issue, and it's just a question, I think, of degree as to whether or not, um, you know, some relatively small budget can make it acceptable or not. Now, the question that I had is, is I noticed in one of your installations, you did a parking garage, and then you also did the top of a roof. When do you decide to do the carport look, which I think, is that is that uh, Bergen County that you did the carport or are doing the carport? Well, with Bergen County, we actually did one roof top, which is on top of their prosecutor's office. So hopefully none of your listeners have to go visit the prosecutor's office, although if they do, uh, it's covered in, in solar panels. And that's something that's not even really visible from most perspectives, although you can see there is a, a, an aerial photo from the air of it. Then over at... Uh, one county plaza, which is Hackensack, which is the county seat for Bergen County, there they didn't really have enough rooftop to make a dent in the kind of power they were using. But they have this huge um, open-air parking garage, like the kind you get at a shopping mall, four, four flights up. So we built, in conjunction with our construction partner, a steel canopy that covers that top floor. And that steel canopy is covered in solar panels. There's a lot of benefits to it. One is that was the biggest, flattest space available at a, at a, you know, in a pretty urban area. But the other is that it protects the cars from, you know, rain and snow. It also, in situations where you're putting these carports up, it will make your, uh, your investment, your infrastructure, the asphalt or the, the parking garage, they're really protected from the elements to a large degree. And in general, they'll last longer. That's true for the roofs as well. So those are some side benefits to having a solar solution put on. Plus also the benefit is, is you don't have that black roof up there heating up your building, so you now kind of have like you know, shade above it. Exactly. That's absolutely right. It helps in that regard as well. But the, the, when you do an installation such as um, the Bergen County parking garage, how does that figure into your cost? Isn't that a, a premium for a solar installation? You mean when you have to put a car yes. on or build a structure? Yes. Absolutely. And you know, that's you're, you're thinking about this right. I mean, you know, in order to get anything done in this life, you have to look at the numbers, and that's kind of where, as finance people, we can be a little bit boring, but it's, it's essential. And so when we go in and look at a job, whether it's a roof that needs repair or we want to build a carport or whatever it may be, we have to look at the, all the costs and then say, look, what can we offer in that power purchase program? What kind of, based on all the costs that I'm going to expend on day one, what kind of uh, price can I offer to my client, whether it's a municipality or a, or a warehouse or whatever you like, and does that make sense? I mean, if I'm going to come in and offer him a price because the costs are so high that it's more than he's paying for his utility right now, I wouldn't expect him to want to do that. That will be his choice, but I wouldn't think he'd want to. So what we really do is we put the numbers together. We're very transparent with the clients and say, look, based on this level of investment to deliver, I think, a system that works for you, here's what we can offer you in terms of your power price. And then they compare that to what they're currently paying and say, okay, that works for me or it doesn't, and we, we can go from there. Now, when, when you talk about the purchase price, not purchase price, but the, the price that you're actually um, giving them, what, whether that's between 9 and 10 cents, for, um, is that forever? For 15 years, are you locking into a price, or you, does it have graduated you know, um, percentage increases over the year? It has a graduated percentage increase over the year. I, I think you know, what, what you see that's pretty typical is for an increase of somewhere around 2 to 3%. And that is meant to just model what happens in a really – good case of inflation. I mean, I think what, you know, rate payers have seen in New Jersey, and you can, you can talk to them and you'll hear this firsthand, in many years, in the last couple of years, power prices have gone up by, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 percent in a given year. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, they may be good reasons, they may not be, but the point is that's what's been happening. And so we can lock people in at something much more like 3 percent. We can also lock them in with a 0% escalator if they like, but it's going to increase the upfront price. So it's just, again, it's just sort of putting those numbers together in a way that works for the client and works for us. But one really important benefit, whether you say, is it, can we do this with zero annual escalation or 1% or 2 or 3%, nonetheless, you're basically locked in at a known set of prices for the next 15 years. And your utility certainly cannot do that for you. They, they're not in the business of offering long-term 
hedges on power prices, and it's something that especially a lot of business owners are concerned about these days. If a competitor has a much better you know, electrical bill than they do, and that's a big component of their expense line, they're less competitive. And so just being able to write down what that number is going to be and know what your expense is going to be for the next 15 years, especially with a pretty low you know, annual set of, of increases, is very helpful for budgeting and also just reducing that, that cost item. If you, if you, you know, no one knows what's going to happen with power prices in New Jersey or anywhere else, but if you look at them historically, they go, you know, I think in the last five years it was an annual increase year over year on average of over 8.5% per year. So that can get pretty expensive pretty fast. Before I forget, are you only doing these installations in the Northeast or are you seeking to expand past the Northeast? Well, I think our long-term plan is certainly to go outside of the Northeast. One of the things that, one of the reasons we really focus on the Northeast is, first of all, you know, not everyone wants to work here. A lot of people want to work in California, and there's a lot of business being done there. But we really saw a need here in New Jersey. We've also done projects in Connecticut, and we're working on some in New York and Massachusetts. These are construction projects at the end of the day. And it's not that you can't manage them from afar, but I think that we like to, from, in terms of taking care of our investors and making sure the project goes smoothly, we like them to be within a driving distance where we can always go see what's happening with our project. The other, the other issue is that, and this is different than what has happened in solar in other countries, like in Europe, the U.S. does not have one renewable energy plan. The U.S. has 50 renewable energy plans, or 51 if you want to count the federal government plus 50 different states. So you really need a state-by-state -state expertise in terms of unraveling the regulatory environment and then being able to package that in a way that will work for both your investors and your client on the other side. So we've put together a team with a lot of expertise in the Northeast. It's not that we might not expand later, but for right now we're finding that we're about as busy as we can handle. Now there are other companies that I've run across that are doing similar things to you guys um, in the Northeast. And when I saw you know the PR notice come across that you guys were doing Bergen, you know, actually installing in Bergen County, my question is, how does somebody know? I'm a commercial owner. How do I know that I want to go to you? versus your competitors, because there's quite a few of them out there. What, what makes you guys different? Sure. I mean, I think part of it really is the, the local presence and the fact that we're here and we're available to go meet with our clients. I mean, basically, people are entering into 15-year contracts with us. They can't be too careful. You don't want to do that and then find that someone's just sold your contract or there's no one to maintain your system. So the fact that we're here, and we personally are investors in these systems, which is something we can explore with our clients, and, our, and we give our clients the opportunity to invest if they want to, it really creates uh, a very tight link between the project and ourselves as managing them as developers. The other thing is what you alluded to exactly. There's a lot of people that, especially in New Jersey, it's kind of a hot industry, and so a lot of people are running around uh, offering solar solutions, but if you go look at their website or talk to them in any detail, you find out they haven't actually done any. And I guess I wouldn't necessarily want to be somebody's first. Right. But there are, but there are quite a few that have done a, a sure, lot of them. Sure. That's so right. I just, you know, but they don't have the financing arm. They're more the installer. And maybe they, maybe they partner with, oh, you know what I'm saying? They may partner yes, with. Yes, yes, yes. So that's what I'm yes. not sure which way do you go. Do you go to the financing partner who has the partners or do you go to the person who already installs and then has gotten partners through banking or banks or private equity funds? Sure. Sorry. Great question. I misunderstood. Um, you know, you really can do it either way. I mean, if someone's, some, sometimes companies are looking at putting solar on their rooftop, and in spite of the benefits of a PPA, they've decided for themselves what they want to do. They want to just buy it outright. They're going to write the check. Well, in that case, they don't need us. There's no need for Sunlight to have a financing solution. And they're all set. They've got their money, and they're, they're going to go buy it. They'll deal directly with an installer, and they'll, they'll I'm sure, do a lot of research to figure out which installer is done some projects that they can go look at and, you know, kick the tires and so on. If, however, they say, look, I know off the bat that I'm going to want this financed. I, I don't have the money or I don't want to devote the money, more likely, because I, my business is something else, I think then your starting point is to call, you know, a financier like Sunlight General, and then we have a number of construction partners that we can bring to the client, have them meet them, see who they're comfortable with. But at the end of the day, we have a network of, uh, you know, all, they're all pretty good firms. So I think it just depends on if the client knows uh, that he or she wants to buy it outright, they should just call an installer. If they know they want a finance solution, they should probably start with us because we kind of got to get the numbers to work before we can choose a firm to build it. And what about a hybrid where someone can write the check for part of it but can't write it for all of it? 
that's really unique about our, our model. Um, you know, usually you don't have that option. And I would say that that would be the case if you call some of our competitors that are offering financed solutions. It's unfortunately kind of a take it or leave it. Our model is a little different. Um, we do allow our clients to invest right alongside of us, utterly equal in every way, whatever dollar amount they're comfortable with. And that's a unique um, benefit that the Sunlight Financing offers. The reason that people would do it is they say, well, look, there's all these you know, federal incentives, and there's state incentives, there's these things that I want to take advantage of too. Um, you guys are investing in this because there's a return, and I'd like to have a share in that, but I don't want to spend the full you know, $4 million. I want to put in something smaller. We can absolutely accommodate that, and that's quite unique. And what's the size range that you'll look at? Yeah, I would say the smallest system is probably something like a million dollars. And then from there on up, there really is no size constraint because, ironically, the bigger it is, in some ways, the easier it is to finance. So we try to find a size where there's a lot of opportunity, and we find you know one, two, three, four million jobs are kind of a sweet spot because a lot of financial institutions don't want to go there, and, and we're willing to. Um, so I would say that you know one million and up is about the answer. And when you say one million and up, what kind of uh, KW is that? That's about 250,000, uh, 250 KW. This is a pretty big system. It's a pretty big system. I mean, if you look at the prosecutor's office on the website, that is, you can, you can kind of get a sense of the size of it by looking at the cars and trucks next to it. That's 115. So you're looking at something that's about double that. In some cases, though, if people have, whether they're a municipality or they're a company, they might have multiple buildings. So you could then say, well, we're going to put 100 on this roof and 100 on that roof, and we can do it that way. It's not like it has to be necessarily all in one size. We find that um, organizations that have big parking lots, we can quite often get there. So we're working with a manufacturer in the south of the state, and he's putting, I think his total system is going to be about 400 kW. But if you drove around his site, you wouldn't necessarily think it was so huge. We're putting about 1 to 150 on his roof. We've got another 1, 150 and some uh, carports to protect his parking lot, and then a little bit more on, uh, that's going to go on a field behind his property. So sometimes you can really add up if you have some ground. It's, it's not something, our solution doesn't really work for the residential customer, and it doesn't work for, you know, a, a gas station sized company. But when you start getting into an organization that has either a big flat roof or a fair amount of ground, it starts to be workable. And that may change, by the way, over time. I think as this model catches on, we might see that there's more room for some of the smaller properties to get financed. But right now, we're, we're even willing to go smaller than I think a lot of the guys are. But is, when you talk about, you know, it's hard for people to imagine what a 250K is. What kind of size building would that be? You know, like, like, like a first and second floor. What do you think that size building would be? Well, that's a great question. I think... Um, or even a first, like just square footage of a building. I guess maybe even a first floor, because I see on like the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office, I guess there are two floors? It's, it's two floors, although that doesn't really do you any good, because since you're only putting it on the right. roof, it, it wouldn't even matter if it was ten stories or, or one. Um, but I suppose you'd be looking in that case at something like, you know, maybe 200,000, 100,000 square feet. Okay. I'm not sure of the exact answer, but it's something I could get for yeah, you. Yeah, because I, I kind of, because people get confused as to what that means. Now, what are you typically right. seeing your covering of the electricity costs of, of, of uh, your clients? 20%? Sometimes even more. Uh, the reason for that is because we're in the Northeast, which is very expensive power. I mean, solar is not something that – if someone's in a state where, they're, where their power is extremely cheap to begin with, um, it can be a little hard to find, get the solar solution to work. But in the case of the Northeast where we're all paying a lot for power, I mean, in the city, in Manhattan – I think I'm close to 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh, my God. And I find that, you know, that's as bad as Hawaii. <laughs> and then I find that in New Jersey, our customers are typically paying all in maybe 17, 18, 19 cents, so it's still pretty high. Uh, we can give them something like, you know, as much as maybe 50 percent, but usually it nets out being a 30, 40 percent kind of savings. Now, one question I have for you, because um, I don't know if, if um, you – knew this about me. I'm a sustainability consultant, and a lot of my clients come to me and they ask for me to aggregate them with um, electrical aggregators. And the right. lowest price that I found so far was like 8.9 8. cents a kilowatt, um, and that's mm -hmm. without tax. You know, when you add in tax, it gets, of course, a little higher. So I was wondering, you know, um, where are you guys in that stream? Because if someone says, well, I don't really need solar, I can get this aggregator, 
you know, mm-hmm. where do you, how do you get them to do this? Because are you, are you around their price? Are you higher? You know, am I allowed to ask that question? Sure, you can. Like, for example, it's public knowledge that the Bergen County job was 9.7 cents. Now, in our case, we don't have any additional taxes or surcharges, so that's an important point that you raise. I don't know what the tax would be on the aggregator. I think the biggest reason is that the aggregator is not in a position to offer you a long-term hedge of that price. In two, three years, you could be in a situation where it looked great this year, but you know, in two or three years, you're back with just the floating utility prices. In our case, we really are locking it in for the, for the 15 years. So on one hand, it's a, lo- it's, a, it's a length of how long can you really have this benefit. And then two, it's a question of there certainly are no additional taxes or surcharges. That's one of the benefits of solar. The third is that, and this gets a little complicated. I mean, I, I think that, not to put too you know, uh, sinister a spin on it, but the utilities want you to be a little confused when you look at your bill. It's very, very difficult for people to decipher it. We've all had that experience. But basically, there are two components of two big components of what you're paying in addition to all the taxes. One is what's called supply. That's like for every time you plug in your hair dryer and turn it on, you're going to use a certain amount of power, and you'll be charged for that supply you took. There's something else called a demand charge or a capacity charge, and there the utility looks at your home or your business over a period of time and says, you know, what's the most that Anna uses over a month, or what's the most that Stacy uses? We're going to kind of set aside that amount of power for her, and we're going to charge her just just for the fact that she exists using that amount of power, she's going to get this demand charge. So your demand charge, if you go to an aggregator, is really not included. It's just the supply that you're using. But you still remain, um, you know, you still remain with Con Ed or with PFCNG or whatever utility, and you're getting those demand charges as well. So it ends up being, I think when you look at it all in, it's a little hard to compare apples to apples. Yep. But solar actually reduces your demand charge because it tends to flourish in those hot, sunny days so overall, the utility looks at you and sees you as a less, um, ut- you know, electricity-using consumer. Actually, it's funny because a lot of the aggregators don't want, they will say, you have to tell us if, you have, if you're going to put in solar. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, you know, it's, um, you make a really good point because it's the demand charges that it's, it's um, people don't really get that there's two components of an electric bill. And Mm -hmm. even if you reduce the one, like, you know, out now there's a lot of people, you know, deregulating electricity, and they're like, oh, yeah, but you can get a cheaper one. But they don't tell you, yeah, but you're still paying the demand part. They forget forget to say they still own you, you know. (laughs) You're exactly right. And, you know, and it's difficult to quantify. I mean, like, let's imagine two businesses, and one of them is very normal to schools and anything. And their biggest uh, consumption is on a hot July air conditioning day. And that's very typical for businesses that they use up most of their power on the hot, sunny air conditioning days. Well, solar comes in and takes away that first level of load. And what happens in almost every case for a business like that is their demand charges will go down because the days that they were hitting those maximum peak power days have been reduced because solar is, of course, flourishing on those hot air conditioning days. Imagine another business, I'm not sure what this would be, where they ran big, heavy electrical equipment late at night. Well, in that case, Solar, which works during the day, is going to have no impact on that capacity they're using late at night, and that that customer would not see a reduction in his demand side. I think most customers intuitively, you know, feel that they've seen their bills, they know their bills are the highest in the hot summer air conditioning months, but you can't say for certain, and it's impossible to absolutely quantify. Now, do you guys also do solar hot water, let's say for hotels or um, for schools like universities, or are you strictly just PVs? Or just PV. I mean, I think that could be something we might add on in the future in terms of some additional products we could offer. But the truth is that market's being pretty well served right now, so I don't know that there's much of a need. It is something where if we were doing a pretty sizable system, this might kind of come back to that roof repair question you asked earlier. If it wasn't so expensive to have a third-party contractor come and put some of the hot water on, we could probably roll it into that power purchase agreement price. Uh, It would be something that would be just sort of a transparent discussion with our client, they would get, we would get a price to do the solar hot water, and we would say, hey, let's roll that into the cost of our total system so you don't have to put the money up front. That would be very case-by-case, case, though, because it's not really what we do. Now, let's go back to Bergen, the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office. Did you guys have to do anything with the roof, or was it in good shape? It was in great shape. We didn't have to do anything. So that is that 9.7 pretty typical of what you guys are pricing when you have a good roof and there really isn't a lot of variables involved? I think that's a pretty good assessment. I mean, every situation is different, but the, the manufacturer in the south of the states I was talking about, 
Um, he had a slightly higher annual escalation, but he his price was nine cents. I think that that's a good good base expectation for a clean rooftop. The bigger the system is, the the more economies of scale we get, and so all else equal, a bigger customer would get a better price. So I've seen. Well, prices really vary, but I mean, certainly we've offered even as low as seven cents. But then we have to we have to be very upfront with our customers because I've seen some where you really have to price it at ten, eleven, twelve cents. So it just depends on what's going on with their job. But it's something where we're prepared to sit down with our client and really show them where the numbers are coming from. So it's not a black box. Now, quick question for you because I'm sure a lot of people in the north at northeast at think about this snow. Yes, that's snow. Yeah, yeah, we just had uh, snow. Right. We did. We had a lot. So how does that work with your systems? Do they automatically have something that scrapes them off, or is the maintenance department required to go out there and just whack it off? Kind of none of the above, believe it or not. I mean, first of all, in a small amount of snow, the panels still work. They don't work as well, but they work. I mean, imagine if you had, if you were looking through a pane of glass and there was some, a little bit of snow dusting it, you wouldn't see as well, but you'd still see. And basically what causes the solar panels to work is, is the light, not the heat. It doesn't matter that they're cold. So some light gets through. But then let's say, okay, now it's a really, really storm. There's, there's two feet of snow sitting on the panels. Could someone go up and knock them off, in, knock the snow off? In theory, they, they could. But realistically, um, because the panels are at a tilt, it doesn't take so long, much less time than you think, even in the Northeast, for the snow to slide off. Be that as it may, it's just, you know, it's where we live. It's one of the factors that go into this whole equation. We can look at a given site, you know, in New Jersey, for example, and we know over a long period of time how much sun they're going to get, how much snow they're going to get. Over a long period of time, we can make very good estimates. And truthfully, that's something that really factors into the investor's side of the equation. Both the investor and the customer will see that, you know, in the winter, this thing is really not having a huge impact. But the reason you do it is for the spring, summer, and fall, and especially the summer. You don't really expect it to generate a whole lot for you in the winter. And the expectations that we give to our clients and also to our investors really chronicle that so that people see that, okay, this is kind of an investment that pays off nine months out of 12 or something like so that. So are you really conservative in the numbers as to what the system produces? Yeah, we are because you always want to surprise everyone with a, a better result than a worse result. Um, you know, we, we want investors to feel confident that the system will produce a certain amount of, um, of solar, and we can, we can really benchmark what that means for both the investor and also for the client on the other side. There's not really any benefit in misleading people because they're just going to be disillusioned down the road. And how, it's also fairly easy to predict, which is another important point. And how long has Sunlight been around? Well, as partners, we've actually been working in finance and, uh, and tax and accounting and so on for over 10 years together. But this particular venture, focusing on solar specifically, we uh, began in 2009. And do you see you guys going into other areas of, of financing, like, for instance, like, um, like micro turbines or geothermal? Or are you just going to kind of think you guys are heading solely into solar? It's a great question. I don't really know the answer. I think in the short term we're sticking with solar because we see so much opportunity. Um, but that doesn't rule out for the future. I mean, from an investor's perspective, you might argue that a lot of them have similarities. That's even probably true for the, for the host or off taker. At the same time, in order to do it well, you want to understand it, and I think that we would want to kind of take our time in that regard. Now, since you're only basically in the Northeast right now, what kind of advice can you give someone who's listening to um, this podcast who's maybe in the Southeast or in Texas or California? What should they look for if they want to do this type of arrangement, this PPV? Uh, you, okay, well, you mean if they want to have PV systems uh, put up and they want to do it through a power yes. purchase agreement? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. First of all, if someone wanted to reach out to me directly, I'd be glad to put them in touch with a few of our um, colleagues around the country. That would be one way to do it. You're free to include that information on the podcast. But other than that, I think what I would do is I would Google, you know, solar PV installations in my area, and then I'd call the firms. You will probably get construction and installation firms, as you pointed out earlier, and have a pretty straightforward conversation with them about whether or not they've linked up with a financing partner. A lot of them, the challenge is that a lot of them will say that they have when they have not. But that's something that, again, if someone wanted to reach out to me directly, I'd be glad to steer them to some reputable um, people in the market. That's good because I, cause that's, that's part of the problem is that you get, you, you get a horror story or you hear people not telling you the truth, and then all of a sudden everything's bad. And yeah, they say they have the money and they don't. That's the problem we see over and over and over again. I know that I have talked to some of them where they are linked with a bank and they're looking at 8% financing. 
so you know I don't know how that phases with you guys if, if you guys are if it's better to go with a financing partner versus a bank I don't, I don't you know you've been in the banking industry what have you found to be the differences well one big difference is that many banks most banks will only lend you the money through your solar system against the revenues of your business so let's say that you're in the business of I don't know you know manufacturing shoes they'll lend you the money but basically, if, if something goes wrong, they're going to come back and, and look at the balance sheet of your shoe manufacturing business. That's not something that a lot of owners really want to have happen. Some are okay with it, some are not. So for the ones that are not comfortable with that, a PPA solution will certainly be better because it's, the financing is isolated to the solar system. It has nothing to do with um, the, the business underlying. But supposing someone did get a bank loan where um, – they were, the bank was okay to say, look, we're just going to limit this loan to your solar. We're not going to kind of go after the assets of your business. That sounds pretty attractive. It might be a good choice. But then in that case, um, the host or client needs to be really, really confident that he or she has unraveled all of the tax, accounting, and state regulatory components that go into his region. And that's something you can't be too careful with because if you get the numbers a little bit wrong, it could have, it could really be a poor investment over time because that's where you want to put your money as a business. My last question for you, and we talked about this before the podcast, it is so unusual for me to be talking to a female in this business. How did you get into this? <laughs> well, it's a great question. Uh, well, I think that, you know, being in finance, it's not wasn't necessarily um, all that different. Certainly there were some women, but a lot of men, and so I think to some degree I was sort of comfortable working with guys, but also it's a very construction-oriented business. It's not maybe that, we, you know, maybe women don't want to go into that or they just historically haven't, but uh, it, is, it is definitely unique, and I think it has its own set of challenges, but it also rewards, and it's fun to be a little bit on the forefront of that, of that venture because I think that a lot of women are really excited by renewable energy because, you know, so often women want to do something that, is satisfying to themselves and is making a difference in the world. Not that men don't feel that way too, but it certainly resonates with, I think, female workers, and so I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more of that. Yeah, and you are, you're a great role model for, you know, younger girls to see that there's a woman involved in this. I hope so. That's terrific to hear. You know, so, Stacy, it's been wonderful talking to you. You've actually dispelled some of my own uh, issues with purchase power agreements, and Listeners, this is a podcast as well as a video cast. Um, there's not a lot to the video, but it shows some of the solar systems as Stacy was talking. And I look forward to hearing more about you in the future and, and some of your other installations in New Jersey. So I'm sure we'll keep in touch. That sounds terrific. Thank you for your time, Anna.